All right, I guess we can start now. Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us. My name is Janie Montblanc and I'm the project coordinator for the Great Basin Science Delivery Project. We are pleased today to host our second webinar. Uh, before we uh, move on to that, I wanted to give a little plug for our um, next webinar that will be occurring on the 24th of February. And um, Steve Bunting from the University of Idaho will be giving a webinar in, on changes in fuels across the western juniper, pinion juniper woodland successional gradient and implications for effective use of fire treatments. So now we'll move on to our webinar today. And just to let you know, um, we'll be fielding, I'll be fielding questions after uh, the webinar is, uh, after the presentation is over. So just type in your questions and, um, and we can get some answers. <laughs> okay, thanks. So uh, today, Rick Miller, who is a professor of fire ecology at Oregon State University, will be um, talking to us about the effects of fire and mechanical treatments on plants and wildlife in western juniper, juniper and pinion juniper woodlands. Um, all right, so take it away, Rick. Okay, thank you, Janae. Uh, I'm assuming my, is my screen up on the... Uh, your, your computer screen? Not quite yet. Okay. Well, that, while that's uh, happening, I was just I'm assuming that uh, <clears throat> the audience out there is uh, are working with some species of juniper and pinion, probably the majority of you are from the inner, inner mountain region. And am I up on the, you know, let me know when I, you've got my slide, or the, you're ready to go with the images. It's, uh, I don't see it yet. Did you press? The show my screen button. Um, there we go. It's there. You got it? Yeah. Okay. There we go. All right. So the kind of the key things that I want to talk about today in this presentation, I guess, could be broken up into kind of three things. One is I want to start off on talking about some of the key principles and kind of tricks of the trade or tools that we have to help us predict what the outcomes are going to be, whether it be a prescribed burn or a wildfire burn that goes through an area and trying to determine what, what's going to happen with the site. Um, second, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of our sage step results and we can look at some responses and some photos of what has been happening with juniper treatments across the West, both using fire and mechanical treatments. And I'll be very brief on the wildlife. So I'll make a few comments on wildlife. It'll be fairly general just simply because I, I don't think there'll be, there's going to be enough time. One of the things that I, one of the things that when I start off my fire class, I get a bunch of young students in there, most of them with very little experience with, about fire, and I love to throw this question on them. I'll throw up a slide like this, and I'll ask them, "Well, what do you think this site's going to look like in five, ten, or twenty years?" Or I'll throw another picture up and, and ask them the same question. And, of course, I get a lot of blank stares and a lot of concern that maybe I'll pick on them. But I just want him to get thinking of what kinds of things do we need to be thinking about, what kinds of questions do we need to ask to, to say with these least last two pictures of how are these sites going to respond. Uh, it's really important, again, if it's an area that is just recently burned with a wildfire or if we're planning a burn, we're for sure going to want to know, at least hopefully, we have some idea of, of what that site's going to look like. And so the big component here that we're talking about is plant succession. How is the vegetation impacted by these treatments and how is it going to, how is it going to change? Well, when I think about this, particularly if I'm sitting on an area that I'm, I'm new to the area and I'm looking at this, this site, a couple of the key, key questions are going to be the characteristics of the fire it, itself, particularly the fire behavior, the severity, uh, intensity, which is the energy release, severity is really the actual impact on the site. Definitely the size, the shape, and the complexity of the fire. Uh, how the fire changes the environment or the site are, are very important questions. And something we'll hit a little later is with the fire severity and fire behavior, how much that can be affected by the stage that our juniper stand is in. And it's going to have a huge impact on our plant succession. Another, of course, is the pre and post climate. Tree climate is something that uh, prior to the burn can have some effect on soils, but a key factor is it can have a big impact on our seed, seed pools, what kinds of seed pools we have, good or bad. 
the post climate is going to have a big be a big driver and unfortunately that's one of them I call the wild cards that we don't have a, a handle or really know at the time of the burn or when we're planning what the fire conditions or what the climate conditions will be following the fire. Another important factor is the ecological site. Uh, if you're lucky, maybe the, these ecological sites have been mapped for your area, for your particular uh, map, uh, major land resource area unit, or if it's not, you still should have some handle on the kinds of communities that you're dealing with. But this is a big, big uh, component in, in terms of providing you with some information of what should be growing there on that site, with the potential vegetation, and what the resilience and resistance of that site is going to be to disturbance. And of course, a big component is the pre, <clears throat> what you have there at the time that the wildfire burned or at the time that you're planning on, on the fire. This is such a big, big factor of what you have on the site is going to be a, a big driver in terms of what's going to happen. But of course, uh, highly severe fire can, we can, and I'll show this again, uh, can have a big impact on severity and we may lose some real desirable plants if the fire severity is too high. The, so those are some components that we'll, we'll look at in a little more detail, but that can help us kind of zoom in on how we think it will uh, respond. But, but we're at the same time dealing with a couple of other kind of unknowns and wild cards, or at least things that make it very challenging. That is, in very large fires, particularly wildfires, we're dealing with a lot of landscape heterogeneity. In other words, we have south slopes and north slopes, and they're going to eat, both those are going to respond very differently to, to a fire. Your bottoms, your uplands, if you have a, a quite a range in this slide here, there's quite a range in elevation <clears throat> from the upper to the lower end. So we have a lot of heterogeneity across the landscape and just in terms of the kinds of, of vegetation that we had growing at the time of the fire. Different uh, ecological sites, and then we also, on top of that, the other spatial uh, heterogeneity that we have is the way the fire burns. From the pattern, you can see that not only do we have unburned and burned sites, but also the areas that burn, burn at different intensities and different levels. So not all that fire where areas that burn, burn the same. So there's a lot of spatial complexity. And the last thing that makes you guys' job very challenging is the, in these big areas, oftentimes the amount of information we have in terms of what was growing there at the time or how good our soils maps are can be quite limiting. And then it boils down to personal experience of how well do you know this area. And probably oftentimes there's parts of this area you might know quite well and other parts of the area because of the remoteness that it's very difficult to really know what was there at the time. So these are some things that oftentimes we have to deal with. This is a, a large fire here where we have a fair more spatial complexity than what appears on the slide, but we definitely have different kinds of sites that are going to respond differently to this type of fire. And if I walk on a site like this and I have no information, prior information in terms of the um, investigation, I don't know if that... <laughs> are you guys picking up a lower bar there, Janae? Yeah, it just disappeared. Um, the... There we go. The, what I try to do is if we're going in to monitor a site like this or try to determine how it's going to respond, um, I would try to break it up into some kind of simple units. And that could be like definitely our north and, <clears throat> and south aspects or our more northerly or cooler wetter aspects such as the northeast aspects versus the southwest aspects. We're also going to have bottoms. We're going to have kind of upland type areas. So we have at least probably three to four different types of landscape positions here that are going to have an effect. And, and then the other would be uh, soils. And on this particular site in that flat well, right in the foreground, we have a north and northeast slope, Mount Big Sage. Actually, once we get off the ridge, we have good soils. And then we get out more on that general uh, sloping area, and we have a real difference in soil depth. It's a clay loam soil. but the soil depth uh, changes and we'll go from mountain big sage to low sage. And so we can kind of, even though it, that's pretty much gone, the sagebrush species, but those, that would be another unit that we might think about breaking it up. If we have, if we're lucky enough to have some ecological sites descriptions in the area, even uh, if some of these haven't been mapped in, in detail for this particular site, we could kind of help use those. And it would be really, just like a soils map, would have a complex of ecological sites. We have our north, we have our bottoms, we have the south, 
and again, probably the uh, more gentle uh, sloping areas that would give us some information on the kinds of vegetation we think should grow there, what the succession might be, and what kinds of soils we have. Ecological sites are primarily based on climate, topographic uh, position, and soil. The, the other thing that helps me with site descriptions, part of it is if I know, of course, if I'm very familiar with the area, I'll have some handle on this, but uh, what I call the red flags in site descriptions that certain things pop out that I think, okay, well, this is good or no, this is, is not so good in terms of applying a treatment. And to give you basically an example of those is they both relate to temperature and moisture. And they're going to relate very closely to the resilience and the resistance of this site in terms of how easily it will respond to uh, disturbance and what the likelihood of, of weeds uh, that will come in. So one of these is the soil temperature regimes that are will be in all those uh, site descriptions of soil moisture. And we go from mesic in the warm end to frigid to cryic. In, uh, say, for example, in Oregon, most the low state or our mountain or Wyoming big stage is going to be in mesic, and much majority of our uh, mountain big stage will be in frigid, and then we can get into cryic, which is on the, the, the coldest. And so definitely as we go from mesic to frigid to cryic, we go into uh, the mesic is going to be the area I'll be most worried about for weed encroachment and uh, cheap grass. The Snake River Plain, the Columbia Basin are good examples where the majority of those areas are mesic and where that's just a real problem. Another component in the site description that kind of helps kind of key me in, in terms of what the likelihood of getting uh, good or negative results is looking at the moist soil moisture regime, aridic and xeric. And usually uh, for both, uh, for a good, at least for parts of Nevada and into Oregon and Idaho, that I believe is broken out into greater than 12 inches you move into xeric, which is the wetter. Uh, aridic is more into less than 12. And so again, aridic tends to be more Wyoming big sage to xeric, more into the mountain big sage. So these are good, not absolutes, but they're good to use as guidelines. To give you some examples of the breaks, and I'll give one example in Oregon of the Mount Here High Plateau, and then I'll give another example in central Nevada that uh, where the breaks are and how we might evaluate a site. In uh, Oregon, Mesic is, is usually typically mapped as areas that are less than 4,000 feet in elevation with a plus or minus 500 feet. And that plus or minus depends on whether it's on a south or north aspect. And again, those mesic sites are the ones that we could be real concerned with, with uh, cheatgrass and other introduced Mediterranean species. The frigid is usually between 4 and 6, plus or minus 500, depending on whether we're on a south or north slope. And then cry if we go above the uh, 6,000 mark. And then we have our aridic and our zero. If you look at the example of the picture, this is a blue bunch wheatgrass, um, Wyoming big sagebrush plant community. <clears throat> it's sitting right at about 4,500 feet in elevation. So you can see it's right at the break of mesic and frigid because it's sitting on a west to southwest slope. So it's kind of definitely at the cool end. In fact, we go up probably only a few hundred feet more in elevation above the site. We start picking up mountain big sagebrush. So this is on the cool kind of wetter end of the Juan Big Sage. If we were thinking of treating this site or what the resilience and resistance to this site is definitely going to be much better than much of the lower elevation Wyoming Sage we'd be dealing with. We're probably pushing pretty close to 12 inches of precip on this site. So there's some good things going for this site other than that the aspect is, is a little more on the warmer side. The um, web page down below is one that uh, will click you into your, your MLRA, your major Area. It shows the whole map of the United States, and then you can zoom in into your particular NLRA because it's important to know which unit you're in, which will help you uh, figure out your ecological sites and also how your your regions or soils will be mapped in terms of mesic and frigid. To give you another example within the same NLRA, this one, this site here is uh, a mountain big sage, Idaho fescue. It's at about 5,800 feet in elevation. So we're definitely up getting into that frigid zone. It's also on a gentle, so then it gets steeper as you go away in, into the deeper end of the picture, into a north to northeast aspect. So it's a cool site. And the Idaho fescue should tell us that, that we are on a colder site. And these are the sites that we have the least problem with cheatgrass 
and some of the other energy species moving in. The fescue right after fire generally will decrease within the first year, but, but uh, will recover by year two or the, or the third year. We'll look at a few results a little later on. So this site, if for some reason, say we're burning this site to remove juniper, this is a really high uh, potential site in terms of good probability that it's going to go in a very good direction. Now let's move down into what we call the MLRA. This is the Central Nevada Basin and Range Country. It's not too far from Elliott, the Shell Creek Mountains in the background. You can see right away that the elevation has substantially jumped up as we move south, that, that going mesic and frigid. And the other thing that wasn't done in Oregon, but was done in, in Nevada in their mapping, is they split the mesic and the frigid into warm and cool. So now we, we can get all the way up into over 5,000 or 6,000. In Oregon, we'd be in, in, the, in the frigid, but here we'd still be in the mesic. So here, this is a black sage community, and it's sitting at, at probably pretty close to 6,500 feet in elevation, very high valley. It's an area that had historically has had very heavy, heavy use. There's not a lot of the native perennials in here, but there's still a minimum, very limited amount of cheap grass on this area. Again, I think it's because it's high enough, it's in that mesic cool to frigid warm, where it's high enough that the uh, cheap grass is not going to be as competitive here at this bottom as it would, say, at a lower at a lower elevation. Uh, Precip wise, it's less than 12 inches. And so this site here, it's going to be a tough one for restoration and, and in terms of seeding success because of its lower precip. And again, we get down to setting some priorities and, and looking at some of the limitations of the site. We look at one other site in Nevada. Uh, this is one of our Sage Step sites here. This site is sitting at between 7,500 and 8,200 feet in elevation, so we're up in that frigid cool, which is good news. We see that. We think, okay, we've got pretty good potential. The precip on this site, it's there. It's going to be over 12 inches. We have good precip. It is on a, a gentle uh, west-facing slope, but we have good moisture and good soil uh, temperature conditions. The other key thing here on this slide and on that one big sagebrush side I showed earlier was the composition of those sites. We have a good composite a component of native perennial grasses on these sites. So that adds to the, the resiliency and resistance of these sites to do good things if, if we are to, to treat them. So when we think about the resilience and the resistance, and resilience is we can think about that as how far we can stretch a rubber band without breaking it, and it'll spring right back. So we can treat a site and or disturb a site, and it'll come back to the potential vegetation or the vegetation that we think should be growing on that particular site. Resistance is a good example is the colder, wetter those sites are, the more resistant they tend to be to weed encroachment. Uh, as we drop down and warm things up and dry things, they become less resistant and the weed component, many of the annuals become uh, uh, easier to, to move into these sites. If we were to look at the, uh, the site soil description on this, just reading the soil name, it's, it's, a, it's a mouthful, but it tells you some pretty good points of information here, again, that kind of, you can kind of look at increasing your probability of whether this site is a site that, that has a good potential for treating or not. Uh, the argizerol means it has an argillic layer, so there's a clear accumulation layer below the A horizon, but the zer in front of all means it's zero, so we have over 12 inches of precip. The OL, uh, OLLS means it's a molasol. So we have a, a good organic layer for this type of soil. It's loamy and skeletal, and you notice it's frigid. The lithic to typic has to do with its uh, depth going from relatively kind of on the shallow thin to, to uh, a little bit uh, deeper, more typical for that site. So just if we never visited the site, just looking at the site description that it's frigid, it has an azuric moisture regime. It's a loamy molasol, so uh, clay content gets up a little high. It gets tougher to treat sites. Again, that, that has uh, tells us uh, some good information about whether we might want to consider treating or not. So just to summarize that uh, re when we talk about the ability of these sites to spring back in a positive or negative way, it has a lot to do with what kind of ecological site they are, which means the kinds of soils and the elevation, and are they on the north or south, and definitely the composition of the vegetation there at the time that we treated those sites. To give you a, a kind of a, an example, this is a site, these two plots, they're quarter hectare or a quarter acre plots, 
and these plots are on the same burn. If you look at the one with all the blue bunch wheatgrass on the right, plot 17 is just over the hill about two to three hundred yards away and it's sitting maybe about a, a hundred feet lower in elevation. So elevation is not much of a factor. But one big difference between these two sites is the one on the right is on a north and northwest slope and the one on the uh, left without the blue bunch is on a uh, south to southwest slope so it's a warmer site. It's also more at the bottom of a toe slope, so the soils there are a little finer textured, more silt and clay than the one where we have a little kind of more of a loamy on the right. The other one is, is that we don't know what the history of, I don't know what the history of grazing is on these, but the one here, uh, subplot 17, is actually kind of in a little basin and ephemeral drainage, so it's not wet and actually there's very little, really no riparian, ephemeral riparian area in there. But it could be an area where it would have been easy for animals to collect in, where they could shade up. And uh, so there could have been more heavy, heavier use here. Also, it's not that far from road. It would have been easy to throw salt blocks in there. So it could be, it could be a site factor, or it could be a uh, past disturbance that we see the difference. So the question is, what happens if we treat? We treated this with the same burn. And two growing season after, this is what these two sites look like. You can see we have a good response. We have a good component of the blue bunch on the right. The subplot on the left, subplot 17, came into cheatgrass. And so a real different response. I'll just go back to looking at those two and what we had prior to the burn. In 17, it's, we have some sandbergs in there, very little of the deep-rooted perennial. So a huge difference in terms of what we had prior to and how those two sites responded. Okay, another point that I think is real important, and I've just <laughs> been battling on a couple of papers with, uh, that have been written that basically their premise was that fires really not played much of a role in woodland expansion, but the problem that uh, these scientists had is they did not separate out. Were they talking about old growth or persistent woodlands or newly expanded woodlands? In many cases, they were talking about the old woodlands and, and uh, extrapolating to the new expansion. So another issue is with uh, managers. If they're talking, we're going to go in and restore an area, and so you start going in and you're burning and cutting trees that are centuries old, it's going to be hard for the general public, or particularly the environmental community, to say, well, wait a minute, what do you mean restoring when you're cutting these trees that have been here for hundreds of years? I know in our area uh, it makes a huge difference in the EA and getting it through getting through the NEPA if the old growth has been addressed in terms of, of the treatment. So it's important to, in when it, looking at treatments, to making sure that are we looking at old woodlands or are we looking at shrublands that have been invaded. So there's a number of clues that we can look at. Some are quite obvious and some we need to, to kind of look around and the more we can pull together the better. This slide here, for example, shows it's a, it's a lot of young trees coming in in relatively high density. But if you walk through the site, you can see some of these old stumps, these burn. We didn't cross-state these, but these just looking at the condition, this fire, and looking to size of trees in the background, this fire was probably somewhere in the early 1900s. We can walk through this stand, and you'll find these old snags through the stand. However, they're at a very low density. Uh, anywhere from one to two an acre, maybe to five an acre, where the stand today is coming in considerably more dense. So at least pre-settlement wise, this stand had open scattered juniper trees, which was primarily blue lunch, or, uh, Idaho fescue, bitter brush, and mountain baked sage. Now, most of the mountain sage in this picture is not looking well, and that's mainly not as much from the trees, but this site was hit by a rogamoth just uh, two years prior to this picture being taken. So looking through these stands and looking at not just the new stuff coming in, but is there any signs of old orange wood that kind of might give you a feel for what uh, this site might have once been. Of course, another one is looking at the age structure of the stand. Here we have a stand of relatively old trees, and there's a lot of old wood laying around on the site. So this stand here on the Kaibab Plateau is, has been on this particular site. It's relatively thin soils uh, for a long time. The nice thing with the country that we work in is that old wood lasts for a long time. In this picture here, you can see here's a snag still standing, and we cross-dated this, and this tree died in 1600 AD, and it's still standing. So 
So we can easily go through and kind of determine what the age structure or what the structure of this community was, has been for the last several centuries. It's also important to look, if you're scrounging around, to look at where are you finding the old stuff. For example, in this photograph here, this is a very, very old piece of wood, uh, considering its condition. And it's centuries year, years old, and there's a number of pieces all along this rocky rim. But we're finding the oldest and these old trees up on the rocky rim, whereas we're getting into more deeper soil areas is where we have all our young. So again, that kind of presents a picture of what we think of today a lot of times is we see the old trees on the more fire protected sites. But that's not always the case. And in this here again, this was that one uh, site that I showed earlier. This is an interesting site. The tree right behind the stump, this big one right here, is about a 250 year old tree and we have old stumps. So again, this site had enough fire to keep it very open, but there were scattered old trees on this site. And, this, and the soils on here are are moderately deep. They're ranging from about 20 inches to about two feet, feet deep across this particular site. This is a good example of a classic mountain big sage where we see a lot of young trees come in, but this is actually an old woodland that is reestablishing itself after a fire that occurred in uh, 1918. So you walk through this and it's loaded with down logs, old stumps, uh, relatively high density, so this site here is a site that, uh, at least pre-settlement-wise, probably did not have a lot of fire in it. A fire did come through. It's interesting that on this particular site, there's enough fuel on here. You'd think it would, it would have burned more regularly, but it could have to do with its being somewhat isolated landscape position where some of the surrounding communities have protected it from, from fire. But again, look at the old stumps and the old wood and see what you have. Another clue that you can use is looking at its, land, it, its position on the landscape. Is it up on rocky ridges? Uh, in the Kaibab, there's areas that either are, have old trees because the soils are relatively shallow or thin, or sometimes you'll have these sites that are relatively isolated. When you think of fire, a lot, a lot of our fires are relatively small, but the fires that really burn the most of the acres are the big, are the big fires which are small minority of our fires are big, but they account probably for over 90% of the acres burned in the western U.S. every year. And so fire is a landscape process, and if you have an isolated plateau with a bunch of old trees on it, it's uh, probably because that site has been relatively isolated and you'd have to have a direct lightning hit on that plateau to start a fire. You'd have less of a chance of fire moving in from an adjacent site. So landscape composition can make a difference. This is uh, quite a difference in age structures. You look at this, and well, you could map the soils on uh, on this slide just looking at the age structure of the trees. In the foreground, you have uh, these small sapling-sized trees that are probably 30 to 40 years of age, and we've got mountain big sagebrush growing. This probably uh, actually burned, but then you can see as you have the older trees up above that are probably more in the 60 to 80 uh, range, right below the, the ridge top. Thinner soils, and obviously what probably happened on this site is a fire came, the last fire that came through burned the area right where you have the younger trees that have come in since the fire, but the soils were thin enough that most of those trees above it survived, and so the fire really didn't move up into that. But it shows you the, the effect of landscape position. And where do you have the old trees? The old trees are up on the rim. There are some young trees up there, but all the pre-settlement trees in this photo are up on the ridge and up through this whole basin, that's where they all occur. Everything down below are young trees, so again, indicating that, that there probably had been fire had played enough of a role to keep the uh, trees from moving down slope into the deeper soils. The question here, this is down in California, that if you're looking and uh, we were on a tour and there was one person from an environmental community saying, well, you, know, you look at these sites, how do you know this is not reestablishment? this really encroachment into a new stand. And part of it, again, are some of those tips that I mentioned. You know, look at, see where the old stuff is and what kind of site is it. And this landscape actually has both. It does have open stands of old trees that are occurring on the thinner soils, and 95% of the time those trees are occurring where you have low sagebrush. In the foreground, this is where we have deeper soils, we have uh, bitter brush, and there's some short-growing mountain big sage. These soils are probably more on the shallow 
and but just deep enough for Mount Big Sage to be growing, but this is where we have all our young trees. So you, again, the older trees are growing on those thinner soil sites, but where the trees are coming in the highest density are all young, no signs of old trees, and they're coming into these deeper soil uh, communities on this particular landscape. Uh, what, I think this is the last example here. This is a site very, very productive and I, you can just tell the soil that these uh, mountain big sagebrush plants are about three to four feet tall. They're good size, very dense. Uh, we're in a high precip zone here, pushing uh, 16 inches actually. Here we have deep mollusoils. We're not very far from the ponderosa pine. You can see a ponderosa pine sapling coming in on this site. So this is a very productive site. We don't find any old trees or signs of old trees on the on this type of site here. And again, these are guidelines, and this means that if, if I were to say that, I'm going to be right most of the time, but not all the time. There's always going to be the exceptions. And we get some sites that I've seen where we have old trees on deep soils, and I'm not really sure why they're there, but they will. So basically, you're just really trying to narrow it down to increase the odds and where you have a pretty good handle of what should be there and what likely will come in after, or depending on the length between the fire intervals. Again, the old growth, I know in some places is a big issue, and if it's been addressed, it has a much better chance if, if the uh, EA goes to court, has a much better chance of, of going through and making it if the old growth has been, has been um, addressed. And, and there is definitely a lot more complexity in old growth stands and young stands with the dead wood, the cavities, the size of the wood, the big shaggy bark. Uh, one time we were aging a tree and we were pulling off some of the bark off and there was a big layer of bark we peeled it off and there was a bat tucked right underneath that bark up next against the the, uh, the tree and of course lots of cavities. Our cavity nesting species increase significantly uh, many fold over young juniper stands so these can provide some pretty important wildlife habitat. The other thing I want to address it has to do with the phase and the stage of woodland development it, because it's a huge factor in terms of influencing the response that we are likely to have occur following a burn and we'll look at some pretty good examples of that. This would be a kind of a classic we have our stages broken in but just kind of conceptual one two and three. Uh, this would be a two where the shrubs are still a very important component in the site. They're having influence on competi competition and soil nutrients and energy but the trees are also having a, a major impact. We still have a pretty good grass component on this site. And early phase one would be where we have a lot of young saplings or small Christmas trees that we have here in the foreground. The shrubs are in the grass component would be the dominant uh, vegetation having the dominant role on the ecological processes such as the water cycle, nutrient cycling, and energy cycle. And then we move into a site that's still not at full canopy closure, but it's getting very close, and this would be phase three. We're starting to see a lot of mortality of our sagebrush. Um, we're losing some of our perennial grasses. We're starting to see a tightening up of the uh, leader growth on the trees showing, particularly the smaller trees showing that the site is approaching full capacity. You can see our fuel loads are changing. It's going to make it very tough for burning a site like this compared to something like, like this site here. And the uh, seed pools are going to be changing, and it's going to make it more difficult to uh, restore the site and more costly. In terms of timing, some of you might have seen this. These are a pair of Robin Tausha slides down in central Nevada in the Shoshone Mountains, and we have a classic kind of phase one, phase two taken in 1973. And within a 34-year period, we've shifted up one more phase. And so suddenly we've gone from a site phase one easily uh, treatable, lots of seed pool or seed source from our native understory species there, <clears throat> and uh, suddenly going into something where the tree now component is uh, closing in very rapidly and probably within another 10 to 20 years it, it obviously will be into what we would call a phase three. One of the uh, keys when we're looking at stand closure rates is that it, this is for western juniper. But I know there's some old work by Cotton and Stewart in Utah on Utah Juniper where they make a statement that in about a 50-year period they notice that the trees kind of seem to hold their own. They're kind of coming in slowly, but it seems like from about 50 years on is when they seem to really kind of take off. 
And Robin Tausch has said he feels that's a pretty good number for much of the Nevada country. And this what this is showing is the growth rate of a canopy expansion. So you can see for for western juniper, the rate of canopy expansion really increases as we get out to about that 45, 50 year period. So they're putting down a lot of roots. Their canopies are staying relatively small for the first uh, 35 to 45 years. And then all of a sudden, in the next 10 or 20 years, you're going to see more expansion, uh, more rapid rate expansion just because the canopies are expanding more rapidly than they did in the first few decades of development. This just is kind of another figure to be used as a tool to figure well, how long is it going to take uh, as we move from one phase to the next, which makes a big difference in the way we're going to or be able to treat the site, whether we use fire or some issues or problems we'll have with cutting. And you can see for what the top line is there, where I get the stay enclosure arrow coming down to, that would be for a more productive wetter site. And then the lower, smaller dash line at the bottom would be for a drier site. So basically, <clears throat> what it's showing is that we typically find on these drier sites, it's going to take at least 120 years for that site to start finally closing in on those dry, dry end sites. Again, for Western Juniper. If we come up to a wetter site, we're finding that we're moving into pretty tight, complete stand closure within 75 to 80, 80 years. A lot of it will depend down here at the bottom how what our tree density is and how quickly they establish. And again, this is kind of just used as a guideline, and it could take longer depending on if we have low establishment rates in here, it could take over 100 years to, to close in. But usually right in this period, right in here on these more productive sites, around 60, 70 years, we start seeing a real reduction in tree ring width, which is showing that the trees are starting to compete with themselves. And when they're starting to compete with themselves, pretty much our, our shrub component <clears throat> is in a major nosedive, and, and we've lost a high percentage of our, of our sagebrush. So it kind of gives you a, a handle on, on the rate. The tough thing with when we get into a situation like this, now here's a site that has actually a pretty decent amount of grass, which means we're on a deeper soil, but it's a closed phase three stand. Is It's tough to burn a site like this because we don't have, uh, we have the canopy. It'd have to be a canopy fire pretty much, but it can happen. Uh, this is a different site, but this was a closed woodland, very little in the understory, but actually a pretty good grass component because it was on a north aspect, deep soils, very hot, hot wildfire. And this site, we had huge, heavy mortality on our understory species. And this is what the site looked like two and three years after, after the fire. We had plots in here prior to the time that the fire burned. So we had a good handle on what we had in the understory. And then the site burned. We relocated those plots. And uh, we followed uh, the succession. And we had. Uh, over 80% on this particular site, we actually had close to 99% mortality of our grasses. We find when we burn phase three, John Bates has also done a fair amount of burning in phase three, finds that uh, we both find we're getting 80% or more mortality if, if we get a fire in these kinds of, of situations. This was the same fire, this is on Juniper Mountain, same fire, and it, it could have occurred at a different part of the day, maybe not quite as hot. But we were, in this particular area, the stand was more open, uh, definitely more of a phase, phase two stand, more open. You can see the needles that are present still on the tree, so it tells you the fire wasn't near as hot as it came through here. And we had over 90% survival uh, ship of our understory species on this site, compared to just around the corner down slope where the fire, fire hit the burn much hotter in a denser stand where we had just the reverse. We had um, we yeah, we had less than 10% survival survival of the uh, deep root perennial grasses and many of our forbs. So that burning in if we're doing work in that late phase, that's a problem. This is a wildfire that occurred over in the Stansbury country in Utah, and it's a phase open stand of juniper phase two blue bunch wheatgrass in the understory. And again, it burned under wildfire conditions. It's not a prescribed burn. But blue bunch wheatgrass looks really good on this site uh, year two and year three after the fire. So there was limited. We didn't have any plots in here. But just looking at old crowns and things, there was a very small percentage of mortality that occurred on this site. 
The other problem, of course, we get into restrictive layers where we can lose our major understory component and we lose our fuel. So the only way we could get really around this is with cutting. What happens when we get these restrictive layers, this site here has a cemented ash layer 18 inches below the soil surface. And you can see it just compresses all the juniper roots. And you see that thick matter. It almost looks like a Sandberg's bluegrass sod where you have this thick sod layer, very dense roots, and it takes out most of that understory. And so we're looking at, at a very uh, low potential for a good response if we go in and, and treat something like this that that's, uh, we've lost so much of the understory and probably had a fair amount of erosion on this site. Okay, so we'll shift and just take a look at it's a few of our SAGE uh, step results and see how it fits into some of the things that we've been talking about. We, uh, this is looking at both where we did nothing, we had the mechanical, where we cut and left the trees, and we did the burning. The sites are located uh, across the west. We had three in Oregon, one in California. We did have one in uh, Idaho, but uh, the uh, Western Watershed Coalition slowed us down, and, and uh, we weren't able to burn until it got through the court case, and then they allowed us to burn, but it was November. And as you know, it's kind of really difficult to burn in November in this country. Uh, Nevada and Utah are our location for our other sites. What makes this study different than a lot of other studies that have been done is most of us in, in the research world and scientists, we make our life a lot simpler than what you guys have in that we try to get rid of variation when we apply treatments. We try to get uniform sites and so we're not dealing with a lot of variability. But when you guys are burning chunks of 1,000 acres or 10,000 acres, you're burning across a lot of variation. And so with this study, that's what it's forced us to do, is we're burning across a lot of variation, both on site and then plus looking at the results across the big region just to see, well, what are the trends and what seems to be holding up and what's consistent and what might be different across these sites. So we're dealing really with a lot more types of variation that are going to be done uh, at, a, at a management scale and a management level that uh, most of you are going to be working and dealing with. We uh, burned these, these sites in some cases to get them to burn. We had to drop some trees the year before to get a little fuel uh, to carry the fire. And then we also uh, cut and, and drop these trees. I'm going to just show you a few graphs. Uh, but this one here is just what you'd expect with the burning, just to show you uh, we had a pretty complete, this is across all the sites, all the sites, Utah, Nevada, California, and, and Oregon, where with the uh, mechanical, and one of the advantages of mechanical is we really didn't have much impact on the shrubs. In fact, maybe we even had a slight increase over the control. And this is the first three years the dash line represents the, the uh, treatment. This is information that we collected two years prior to. And uh, these are the number of sites. So we didn't have, uh, we had six sites. The first year, and it had to do with the number of burning, how many we were able to burn. We had 11 sites uh, in our uh, full sites across that region. So this is just the number of sites that the, each of these points here represent. So you can see, obviously, um, the decline in the shrub component down to less than 5% where we, we did apply the fire. One of the key things, and it was interesting to look at this and also applying it to a major literature review that a group of us did through the Conservation Environmental Assessment Program, which was western-wide across the tall grass prairie and the intermountain rest in the southwest to see what, if you summarize science, how does it, what does it seem to consistently say? And it was interesting to compare these results. So obviously, when we burned that first year, we increased bare ground. You were going to remove the woody plant component. And even if you get a good response from your herbaceous vegetation, generally, it's not going to fill out all the, the bare ground. And this is always one of the concerns that first year is we kind of open this site up for potential encroachment. So that's why it's going to be really important to know what is our weed source on this area, what kind of ecological site is this particular site. On this site here, we did not have a weed problem. We're up around 5,000 feet in elevation. We have a frigid soil. The predominant grass in here, you see Indian rice grass and blue mines, but the predominant grass on this site is Idaho, uh, Idaho fescue, so it's a relatively cool, cool site. If we look at the response of all the sites, you can see that obviously in the first year we dramatically increased bare ground. 
we went from about 30% up to 45% bare ground. But the other thing to note is that by year two and year three, it's really recovered very rapidly. By, so by the second year, it's almost fully recovered. And by year three means that it's filling in with something. And we'll take a look at that also here in a minute. This is our control treatment. We can see the bare ground due to climate conditions or whatever is slightly increasing. But there's really not difference amongst these points anymore. But bare ground, we did significantly increase it that first year. So that's always a bit of a concern that, that first year. The, um, on, the, on the cut treatment, you can see, of course, we increased. You'd expect it. You dump a lot of material on the ground. We're going to increase the, uh, the amount of cover. But then as the needles drop off then year two and three, that component will change. But I'm going to also show you something is one of the disadvantages of dropping, dropping these trees uh, can have a smothering effect. So if we look at the percent of tall perennial grasses, and maybe it's because I'm a range person, but I feel these have a huge uh, importance on a site in determining that site's resistance and resilience to keeping stuff that we don't want in there, such as cheatgrass, from moving, moving into the site. You can see that across all the network, all the sites, that we had a significant decrease in our native perennial grass cover the first year after fire. And that fits the conservation environment assessment review that we did. We reviewed uh, nearly 200 papers on that. That rarely, rarely do you have an increase in your herbaceous layer that first year following fire with your native perennials. But this also shows that across the network, across the woodlands, that by year two, and these sites generally were in really pretty good condition. We did have some sore spots on these sites, but by year two, the site is recovered, and possibly by year three, it's actually now the herbaceous component is exceeding that of the control. We see the mechanical uh, didn't do much the first year, which is pretty what I think fits in with what I've observed over the years. And then we see an increase. And then it kind of levels off. And it's going to be real interesting. This is only the first three years of, of how this might play out. So to just take a look at uh, one of our uh, sites, this is down in California. You can see this is just the graph we've been looking at. This is uh, prior to, to burning. This is their first year following fire. We've removed the woodies. We've decreased our herbaceous layer, um, <clears throat> our cover. We, we've removed the litters. We have more bare ground. And this is what the site looks like to, in the second growing season. So there was definitely, it's coming back and possibly exceeding to what that site looks like. The uh, annual form component, and this is going to be native annuals. We'll take a look at quick first look at the annual form component. Mechanical, really, not much happened, but we do see a significant increase in, in our native annual forbs. And I'll have a picture of that here in, the, in a few minutes that I'll show you. But significant increase in, in the annual forbs, which come in right after fire, first year one, two, and three. If we take a look at percent sage grouse food, these are the forbs that have been reported in the literature that sage grouse like to eat. We can see that in the burn treatment, and particularly in year two and three, we we greatly increase the availability of sage grouse food forms. Now, the one thing with this, though, is we have to handle this information cautiously because 80% of these food forms are the annuals. And we're only three years out, and very likely the annual component in the next year or two will start to decline as the perennials take a greater hold. So the sage grouse food form probably is going to be, my guess, is going to be a, a short-lived at least uh, from the annual uh, component, will be a short-lived uh, resource for the birds. Now, there are some native uh, perennials in there that are mixed. And if they uh, stay increased and increase, but the variation on those is so high, it's hard for us to really pick up if, if it's, we're picking up anything significant. The exotic grasses, of course, are always our big concern. And it's, it's mixed. This is uh, one of our sites, and I'll just show you. This is uh, kind of what you'd expect in a way. Is well, right after we really didn't that first year, we did not see an increase. We see a major increase in uh, a very rapid increase in that exotic grass component. Is if prior to the burn, that's our major component. 
if it was a minor component, oftentimes we don't see a big expansion in the first year. But then in year two and three, we can see, uh, see an increase, which you see the greatest magnitude increase occur in the burn. But we're also seeing, not at the high a level, also a, in, uh, occurring in the mechanical treatment. Now, we're looking at differences of just under 10%. 8% prior to burn, and we're kicking it up, so maybe about a 5% increase in cover for the, for the burn, burn area. So again, it gets down to this variation that we deal with. This, these next two slides I'll show you are on the same burn. This is probably a little deeper soil. Deep response, they're native perennials, the fire burn through here. Very little cheatgrass in this site prior to the burn and hardly any after the burn. This is probably several hundred yards away. Uh, granted that much of this has been burning in, right in here along where you see the real dark green was the duff layer underneath the tree where the cheatgrass came in. But it does expand and it's real patchy out, out into this area where it hit thinner soil. And so we had a mix. We had some really great sites and some sites with that we, we see this, this happen. The issue that we see with, with our increase here in our mechanical treatment, which is the green line, is that we're getting a smothering effect. And particularly with the big trees and at the base of those big trees, that if you drop these trees where you've got some good perennial grasses, you'll have mortality, you'll get a smothering impact, and then oftentimes you'll, if the needles start to drop off, you get a little more light, you'll get a cheap release of cheap grass underneath where it was real uh, dense. Out there at the end of the tree, or if the trees are smaller, Oftentimes, we'll see a higher percentage. It will be more likely things like squirrel tail that will come in on those sites. So you can see that the density, the more trees you have and the bigger trees you have, the more smothering impact you're going to have. And that relates back to the phases. When we're thinking of treating these areas of a phase one, two, or three, the more trees, and getting to that phase three, we have more potential smothering impact that can, that can uh, <coughs> possibly increase these exotics. We always get the hot spots if we do some piling. This was a duff layer. This is, um, again, one of our California sites. And what was interesting in the California sites, rather than cheatgrass, was mostly Descarania that came in. So it was our exotic forb component that moved into these sites. And again, you, not uh, unexpected, we see an increase in exotic forbs as we move into, um, into the, the burn treatment on those particular sites. The, the biggest question is, when we get these patches of exotics out there, what are they going to do? Are they going to decrease? Are they going to just kind of stay there and wait for the next fire to come through and maybe expand a little more? Or are they going to gradually creep out on their own? And those are all very, very good, very good questions. It probably, again, is going to relate. Factors are going to influence that will be the ecological site. So one of our sites is down on a warm mesic soil. It's aridic, and we, it's the site of all of our burns that we've done where we've had in Oregon and California, and I know in the Nevada sites, it's the site we've had the greatest in, increase in our cheatgrass and wheat component. I was out with Bruce Rowney on one of the Utah sites uh, that looks really pretty good, but there's these like quarter-acre patches of cheatgrass out on those sites. And the question is, OK, what are those going to do over time? So definitely, the, the ecological site is going to have probably an effect. The cooler, wetter those sites are, the more competitive our native perennials will be. Um, what, how, what our density of free treatment native grasses were on that site is also going to be a, a big factor. How these sites are managed following their time of treatment, and definitely climate, post-climate, is going to have an effect, which could either help us or hinder us in terms of what happens with those exotics. So that's a tough one. And, and again, all you can do is, based on the ecological site, you probably could increase your probability of, of guessing right of which way it's, it's going to go, and definitely knowing what the pretreatment composition was and the management would increase your <clears throat> probability of, of making a good choice or making a better decision on, on the succession. This is an interesting site here I show you. These are all native forbs that came into the hot spots. Right here in the foreground was a down tree that was cut. And you can see the hot ring here. And then here's the depth layer of this tree. And you can see it back for this tree also. They all came into ground smoke, Gaeophytum, Pelignum, and a couple of the small epilobiums, which is the little uh, fireweeds. 
hardly any cheatgrass or descarini on this particular site. Part of it is uh, part of it is the elevation. This site's 5,800 frigid soils. It's an azeric moisture regime, so that definitely helps. We don't have uh, we have very little cheatgrass seed source up here. It is up here. We even have a few patches of Medusa head up, up in a few locations. But again, these are the kinds of things that if someone said, okay, we're going to burn these hot spots, what's going to come in? I would not have been able to say, well, no, it's going to be obviously native, native uh, perennials will come in, or native annuals will come in on this site. This one uh, would have been a hard one to call, and you just, you just don't know what's likely to happen. On the Blue Mountain site, a little bit warmer, a little lower in elevation, still frigid xeric soils, uh, those came in to, to Descarini. Um, probably the uh, grazing management over the years, this one is more remote, probably hasn't been impacted quite as high, but, but I don't know. There's always going to be the variables in there. That all you can do is, is if you do a good job in, in asking the right questions, you can narrow down and you can increase your probability of being right, but you never will be right all the time. Uh, just a few, few brief statements on, on wildlife. We've, we, on the Sage Step project, we have uh, Steve Knick is doing the wildlife work, and that's currently being summarized. But we've done a fair amount of work over the years looking at avian communities, even in some small uh, animal communities. And of course, you know, the big component with wildlife in terms of how they're going to be impacted by what we do in the landscape is all based really on the structure and composition of vegetation, which has everything to do with where they nest and what they eat. And it's not only at the very at the site level, but at the landscape level. So how individual sites or stands or communities, and then what composition of patches and communities you have across this landscape. Uh, some of our work shows that <clears throat> sagebrush obligate species <clears throat> that uh, were definitely a factor. We looked at the community itself, which was sagebrush, but we had a higher diversity of those species and other species if that sagebrush community was within a uh, kilometer or, say, about two-thirds of a mile from either a riparian area or an aspen stand. So what is happening and going on in the vicinity around that site where you may see those species is having a, a big factor in terms of the, how the quality of that habitat. One, one thing that, and this is on that handout with the definitions, <clears throat> that sometimes it's hard to remember all the requirements, but, but you, these are some helpful kind of tools if you're looking at, at avian or mammals in terms of breaking them out into some kind of a guild. In other words, a guild is something that kind of is uh, a trait that brings these species together that's something they have in similar. For example, nesting, if you think avian species, you've got ground nesters, scrub nesters, tree. Some species uh, will nest in the mid, upper, upper canopy of tree and cavity. So obviously shrub nesting species are going to be more impacted by a fire than many of the ground nesting species, although not all. So breaking them up into thinking how do these birds reproduce, what kinds of cover do they use, what for all animals, what kinds of food are they depending on, it's going to really uh, give you kind of a guideline in terms of what the overall impact will be on the composition of these species. We just think of ground uh, set in nesting species. The Vesper Sparrow is a ground nester and it nests underneath grasses. So definitely when we do any kind of burning, we always we basically always see an increase in Vesper Sparrows. They, they like more of those grass dominated plant communities. But not all ground nesters are the same. The sage grouse it also is a ground nester, but it nests underneath sagebrush. So fire has a, a dramatic impact, significant impact on sage grouse nesting habitat. So again, when I'm looking at treatments, it's important to consider that and consider how the treatment's impacting when you look at the whole entire landscape. Sage rafters and other, they're sage brush obligate, and they nest in the shrub. And then you have cavity nesting species, which are snags could be uh, a good thing, or again, the older, older stands of trees. This is based just kind of a uh, conceptual graph based on Several years of data we collected in looking at fire and burn areas, shrublands, uh, kind of open phase one, all juniper all the way to closed stands. And you can see how the species the shift, composition changes. The other thing that, look in the middle of the graph, here we have several 
three sagebrush or four sagebrush obligates actually. The green tail towhee, brewer's peril, sage peril, sage thrush are all sagebrush obligates. But you can see they have different tolerance levels to juniper and also the burn. The brewer's peril will see lower numbers of brewer's peril in grasslands, adjacent grasslands. We do the shrubland, but we'll still, still see brewer's peril out there feeding in those, those areas. For sage thrashers and sage sparrows, we rarely see out in the burn areas. The burr sparrows also don't seem to mind having a little bit of juniper in the neighborhood as long as there's shrub cover in the end of the story. But the sage thrasher is very sensitive to juniper presence. And the sage sparrow is a little less sensitive but more sensitive than burr sparrows. Retail towhees actually like to use the juniper to perch in it along the edge, but they'll oftentimes be working the edges of, of the uh, sagebrush. So I know some of the old literature um, talked about juniper woodlands, that sometimes your juniper woodlands can have the highest diversity of wildlife species. And so that could be taken as a good thing. But looking at that work and where the work was done, it was generally in these open, more phase one, phase two areas. And if you were to draw a line across where you capture say from the top of this graph down to the bottom where you're going to capture the most species, definitely you're not going to have them all in this zone here where you have the shrubs and the trees, but that's where you would have the highest density or biodiversity. The, um, so it's, it, it really has to do with the structural complexity of your understory. If you move into these closed stands, the diversity drops and you're pretty much into your, your tree nesting species. And even with your tree nesting species such as mountain bluebirds, will go out into the sagebrush and, and feed. So it's, and the other issue is when you're in this kind of open woodland area, the question is, as we've seen from some of the previous graphs, is how long is it going to take for that to move into, into, this, into this direction to, the, to my right, going into a closed stand where we're going to see a decline, basically, of, of these species up, up in, in this area. The other issue, of course, and it can be a tough one to address when it's talking wildlife, particularly, say, sage grouse, looking at, and that is the question of recovery rate. How long is it going to take for the sagebrush to move back in on these, on these sites? And if you look at the literature and also look at, this is a whole series of different plots that we measured, pretty much if you have a complete burn, it's going to take somewhere between 20 and 30 years for that mountain, big, we're talking mountain big sagebrush, to come back to 25, 35 percent pre-burn cover cover levels. Some of these here, where within 10 years we were at 20 percent, and this one 30 percent. All of these were fires that were very complex, a high degree of complexity. They were there, real mosaic, seed source close by, and so those stands recovered very, very rapidly. It was amazing to go back on those sites, and, and you could almost hardly tell, other than the juniper snags, that those sites had burned because of of how a mosaic. You get these areas out here. Some of, we have these areas, these two sites here, occurred on an area where we had a very large burn. Sagebrush seed disseminates only a few meters from the plant. They don't wind blow. They don't go very far. So these are sites here that we had very likely, uh, if we had a seed pool, that seed germinated, but we didn't have, we had poor weather conditions following the fire. Those seeds germinated and did not establish. And so suddenly we lost the seed pool, so then the only seed available, these are very large burns, where the only seed available is from the edge. So they took a very long time to establish. So the seed source and what happens the first two or three years following burn is a major component and very important in terms of determining how quickly that sagebrush will come back in following the fire uh, on its own. And it's going to be dependent on that seed pool, which is probably good for two, maybe as far out as three years. Uh, but after that, it's either germinated and, and, or seed viability is lost and, or it's germinated, but it didn't establish or we've had some seed predation by insects or small, small mammals. Then it's going to be totally dependent on the outside edge. So just to summarize then, that when we're thinking about these large burns and how we might try to restore them or if we're talking about prescribed fire, Thinking about the ecological site, or if you don't have that ecological site information, use your best experience and knowledge or local knowledge of what do you think should be growing on those sites. What, what grass for me, if we've got Idaho fescue, that's a great uh, component telling me these are cooler sites, wetter sites. 
and that my potential is going up, I have less chance for weed encroachment. But what do you know about the elevations? And I know Jeff Rose, I was talking to him recently, prior college just over in Burns, he said, boy, we burn a large area and our north slopes and our south slopes respond so differently after a fire. And oftentimes those north slopes will look great and those south slopes may not look so great. So thinking about the potential and knowing that you have a composite of sites out there on these landscapes that you're, you're dealing with. The composition at the time of the fire is also so critical. Knowing what you had or what was there prior to the burn, what your weed, both you know the good stuff and the bad stuff. What kind of seed source? If you have a lot of bad stuff in the area, it means you've got the seed seed sources there, and that in that first year that we've reduced that cover, it's going to have a potential of getting a foothold on that site. Characteristics of the fire, the fire severity, definitely we're finding that we get fires in the, the later stages, the juniper development. We see a lot higher mortality of our desirable understory species, and we have a greater problem with with uh, non-desirable species, the weedy species moving in on these sites. Uh, climate following treatments, nothing, something we cannot control, but we need to be aware that uh, it's going to play a, a big role in reestablishment, particularly of things like sagebrush on these sites. And the landscape heterogeneity, again, is, is just a big challenge for anybody that manages large landscapes and are applying treatments on the ground that are oftentimes bigger than a hundred or a couple hundred acres, but more could be even, you know, in the thousands of, of acre scale. The amount of knowledge and information you have on that site, oh boy, the more you can gather up whatever soils information, ecological site information that you have, local knowledge, uh, going on site saying, well, you know, I know an area that uh, is very similar to this in elevation aspect, it burned 10 years ago, what does that site look like today? And just everything that you have, any, any tool that you can put in your bag to help you make some decisions on what these areas are going to go are going to be uh, very, very helpful in making making your decisions. So, with that, I guess uh, if everybody, I don't know if everybody's the good thing about this. I can't tell how many people fell asleep. <laughs> so, thank you, Rick. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, thank you very much. Um, now we can field questions. I apologize to everyone that we went over time, but we can stay on the webinar as long as people have questions. So please type your questions in, and I will field them to Rick. Um, also, just to let you know, in two days, the GoToWebinar system will automatically send you a link of the recording of this presentation. Um, so I wanted to let you know that. And I think it also will send a, a brief, like, three-question evaluation. Um, so any feedback you have for us would be much appreciated. Okay, thanks. Um, so uh, the first question I have is, and I apologize in advance, I'm probably going to pronounce people's names wrong. Um, so the first question is from Sarah Lovetang, and uh, the question is, are there other weedy species that are a problem? What about Ventanata dubia? Oh, vent Ventanata dubia is uh, one that's <clears throat> been a real problem up in Washington, and uh, I don't know, it was probably 15 years ago, a friend of mine, uh, forest ecologist, Charlie Johnson, made a statement. I was wondering, he would map a lot of that country. He was wondering if I ever ran into Ventanata Dubia, and I said, what is that? I didn't know what he was talking about. And all of a sudden, we are, we are starting to see it. In uh, Oregon, over in the stinking waters, we're starting to see it. So it's one of those that at this point, I haven't seen Ventanata dubia in large abundance coming into burns like we see things like Medusa head or cheatgrass. But it's, again, one of those that, boy, we really need to watch it because it's one of those, is it, well, is it just because the seed source isn't quite there yet? Um, is, it, is it because it's not as well adapted maybe as cheat or Medusa head or it just is a matter of time? And so Ventanata dubia one that, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of worried about it, and I'm going to be real interested to see what, what that thing does over time. Because we had a lot of weeds in the past that, that were small problems to begin with, but then became huge. <clears throat> and I'm sure that uh, there are some, you know, there's some thistles that can become a problem. Um, some of the biennial thistles, though, can come in, and then they pretty much fade out. Some of our rhizomatous uh, thistles, can be an issue. I'm, I'm not as familiar with the Colorado Plateau and some of the weed issues that they have down there, but 
I know Robin Tausch uh, talks about the cheatgrass definitely being a problem with a lot of the, the pinion juniper sites down in, in Nevada. Um, and, you know, there are knapweeds. Uh, we have not, at least in Oregon, in northern Nevada, California, I haven't seen a large amount of knapweeds moving into the uh, pinion juniper yet, which uh, in, we've done work up in Montana, up in some Doug Fur sagebrush areas, and wow, what a different story it is up there where the knapweeds are really moving uh, moving out. White top is one we've seen spotty, but at this point, I don't know. It's not a big problem yet. But it's definitely the ones that we don't think are a big problem now, we really need to watch. And if there's any signs we think that they're starting to move out, well, we really should try to jump on them as early as we possibly can. Okay, great. Thanks. Um, ben Roberts asked a question of me. Will the link have the audio and the slideshow? And the answer to that is yes. Okay, next question um, for Rick. This is from Jeff Rose. Climate change is becoming a bigger issue for the BLM. How do you think that responses to burning um, with cutting will change? Oh, uh, Jeff Rose. Hey, how are you doing, Jeff? Although he can't respond. <laughs> um, the big thing there, of course, is you guys are having to deal with the whole carbon uh, issue and with cutting and burning. And <clears throat> we really need some better information on carbon. One of the key people, Ben Rao, on our Sage Step project is one of the more knowledgeable people I know that deals with soil and carbon issues. And one of the interesting things that he talks about is initially we, we felt, well, if we burn, we're going to lose a lot more carbon than if we, if we cut and drop these trees. But uh, some of the things that is, if you get decomposition going on, if these trees decompose, the so carbon loss will be slower. But unless that carbon actually gets incorporated into the soil, that carbon is going to go back into the atmosphere. So he feels, and some of the work they've shown, is that actually burning, you tend to, even though you volatilize and you lose a lot of carbon very quickly, the ash, much of the ash gets incorporated into the soil. So you may actually, in the long run, get more carbon into the soil by burning than you will by cutting. But again, there's very little limited information on that. Um, it's, I know Jeff's his big complaint is the amount of carbon that you guys are dealing with when you talk about burning is probably pretty small compared to the kind of carbon uh, that, say, rush hour traffic in Los Angeles or Portland will blow off in the atmosphere. <laughs> but um, it's, a, it, it's something that, that I think that we need more information on. We get people like Ben that will we help, at least when you guys are preparing the EA, you can have some feel for what impact are these treatments having, maybe both in the short term on carbon, but we also have to look at the long term uh, component of carbon. So if we lose, if we burn bees under very hot fires, uh, we're not only going to possibly lose more carbon under a wild fire situation, because we'll have a greater loss of the amount of wood that will be uh, burned, but also we could have other uh, ecological impacts on these sites due to soil soil loss and soil erosion. So I feel, I'm glad uh, I'm not the one that has to sit there and, and try to address these issues that we really have very, very limited information on. Uh, but we have a few people, and uh, boy, Ben, uh, he's currently now working as a hydrologist up at the Forest Service, but he'd be a great person to have available to continue to work on these kinds of questions. Great, thanks. Next question from Kelly Reynolds. Do you have any research on PJ sites that have been masticated rather than cut and leave? Um, we, we don't, but Bruce Roundy does. And as part of the Sage Step project, Bruce has been, has been working on that. And there, the big thing is looking at, um, you know, when you masticate that material and what effect, you are going to have some smothering effect, which it does, but then it depends on what percent of the area that you actually cover, and that's going to depend again on what phase that was. If you're masticating in a late phase, you have a larger area masticated than not. You're adding a lot of low quality uh, litter, in other words, a very a litter that has a lot of carbon and very little nitrogen, so the breakdown, it's going to be pretty tough in the microorganisms that break down. It's like uh, feeding them straw versus alfalfa. So the breakdown will be kind of slow and pretty pretty tough on them. So at this point, we I think Bruce, if you have any questions, he would be the best uh, person to contact. He's at BYU, and uh, with with their mastication process uh, 
program. It's going on, but we really have not collected a lot of information. Something that we've done, not mastication, but we've, we are in the process of evaluating where we cut, drop and burn, or we cut and pile and burn. The advantage of the piling, of course, is then when we do a burn, we're not broadcast burning, so if we have a bitter brush, sagebrush component in the inner space, we're not going to lose that shrub layer. The concern with the burning is we're burning and we're going to have much hotter temperatures because of the duration, so we are going to get hot spots, and the question is, will those hot spots come into cheatgrass? And right now what we're seeing is, yes, if it's a real hot burn, but if we burn in the wintertime, we don't see, uh, when the soils are colder, if we can get up on those sites, we're not seeing that uh, quite that impact. So that's another option for look, looking at leaving leaving these trees. But and unfortunately, I don't really have the answers on the mastication, but Bruce Roundy would be a great contact. Okay, thanks, um, Kelly. I can I'll try to I'll find your email in the registration system, and I will send you Bruce Roundy's contact information. Um, if I can do that, I'll, I'll try to do that. Okay, next question is from Jeff Mackey. Handouts were mentioned during the presentation. Where can these be found? Oh, there was um, a link on the initial invitation. Um, and you can also find those. This uh, presentation will also be uploaded to the Great Basin Science Delivery Project's website. And um, if you go to the Webinars and Workshops menu tab on our homepage, you can find, you can find the, um, the definitions handout there as well. Yeah, one thing I'd, I'd like to add to that on that definition handout is, it's, um, I think what's important with that is a lot of times various terms in ecology are not used consistently or they're misused. And um, it can cause quite a bit of confusion. And, and one good example of that in that handout is fire return interval or mean fire return interval and fire rotation. They're two very different terms. And I know Baker, uh, who's out of Laramie, is, is uh, kind of stirred the pot a bit, and he uses fire rotation, and fire rotation has a different definition, very different than fire return interval. And fire rotation was really developed for large pole pine forest that now he's, he's kind of brought into using for down in these areas. And I won't go into defining it because it is in your, uh, it is in the list of definitions. But it's, if you're reading the literature and it says fire rotation or someone talks about fire rotation, you got to understand, and they may not know it, they're not talking about fire return or they're very different. Okay, thanks. Um, so last question it looks like from Jim Hammett. Historically, is there a lot of evidence uh, encroachment of juniper into lowlands that occurred naturally, non-anthropogenically? Um, yeah, there is. Actually, if you look at, and this would come from the pollen record and from... Um, uh, pack rat mittens, <laughs> and, and if you were to take a look at that, what's interesting with some of Pete Merringer's work, that is we, of course, one thing is, is you move north, particularly up in our area, western juniper wasn't even up here 6,000 years ago. During the Pleistocene period, it got pushed way south, so it's been expanding into Oregon, Nevada, and more of its northern range in, within the last five to 6,000 years. We find that um, that it relates a lot to, to climate, and that there were uh, psychic situations where it filled in and it would move out into areas that were more predominantly grass dominated, and it looks like with the pollen record that because of the abundance of pollen, or the lack of abundance, but its presence in the pollen record and in the middens and the grasses, that these were probably relatively open stands with a lot of herbaceous understory and very open, open juniper, but it gets pretty uh, speculative. The, so there has been expansion and, and retraction, but, but particularly where it's been a major component is the Colorado Plateau. And the Colorado Plateau is operating differently, I think, than the Great Basin. And that is you have uh, these major droughts, and there, in fact, there was a big drought in the late 1500s that occurred from about 1575 to 1600. And Tom Swetnam down at the Tree Ring Lab talks about that that it's hard to find trees that predate that, that major drought. They think that that drought was major tree die-off, particularly mainly pinion, and major uh, fire. And we saw the same thing recently in 2002, 2003, or the 1950s, where there were major die-offs due to a combination of drought, 
and uh, beetles, particularly I think that the pinion pine was more dynamic than juniper. The juniper tends to be more drought resistant. So there has been expansion and contraction. Merringer feels that actually in the late 1800s, we were kind of going into kind of a cooler, wetter period, that he feels juniper was actually expanding. And uh, he and I have talked about this, but we also feel that the change in the whole fire regime has really impacted it and enabled it to move into a lot deeper site soil sites like a uh, mountain big sage sites. So it's either greatly speeded it up and definitely had a big impact on spatially where we find it today, where we might have seen it or where we wouldn't see it under a more uh, pre-settlement fire regime. Great. Uh, we do have another question from Nick Padilla. On the central Nevada basin and range, what was the defining what were the defining characteristics to separate the two classes that overlapped on the mesic warm and mesic cool? The, uh, that's a good, the, um, apparently the soil scientists <laughs> are a little more of a splitter down in the, um, in Nevada. So that was the mesic, that was the, was that the mesic cool and the, um, could, what was, could you read that question again? Sure. I guess, on the central Nevada basin and range, what were the defining characteristics to separate the two classes that overlapped on mesic warm and mesic cool? Mesic warm and mesic, okay, mesic cool. The, uh, the you know, the, the cold temperatures are based on how many days of growing season temperatures you have in the soil profile at a certain depth. And of course, there's some information on this, but generally they're pretty much mapping that on a best guess and based on the vegetation present and, um, and kind of what experience for that particular area. So what they did is, of course, there's a lot of overlap, but the music warm is, is they have it plated at 4,000 to 6,000 feet in elevation. Music cool would be 5,500 to 6,500. The overlap is very likely due to, I know we get overlap up here is what aspect we're talking about. So if you're on a south aspect, you're going to have to go up, um, like I know in Oregon, for example, the break is 4,000 feet on the flat, but if you're on a south aspect, you're going to still be in music soils up to 4,500. So I'm guessing, I, I got this, this is the way they're currently mapping the soils in Nevada. I got this from Kurt Lee, who's with uh, the NRCS out of Ely. And they're currently mapping mesic soils from four to 6,000. I'm sure as you're getting up to that 6,000, those are on the south slopes. The mesic, mesic pool is at 5,500 to 6,500. So that 5,500 probably would be more on your um, north aspects. And then as you get up to around 6,000 feet, you could be on the flat. So it all is going to be pretty much boiled down to, to the uh, soil temperature. And I just like to think about it as warm, like I, I do think of our mesic, like Wyoming Big Sage for us, most of it is in that, in our mesic uh, temperature regime. But I do know that, for example, uh, in central Nevada, you have Wyoming Ensis growing into some of the frigid, but probably the majority, again, of your mountain sage will be occupying the, the frigid site. So that could be somewhat of an indicator, although you'll get some mountain or Wyoming sage sites growing up there right at the edge if you're getting close to Wyoming Sage that probably are going to be on that more cool end of mesic or on the warm end of frigid. That would be a good thing to talk to uh, some of the soil scientists that are, are doing the mapping if uh, he's working in, if you're working in uh, the Nevada, central Nevada area, Kirk Leak is one of the major guys doing a lot of the mapping and there's a few others that can help uh, break out and what the soil characteristics are that they're looking at when they map those. And then again, these are only guidelines, they're not absolutes and so it's good to be thinking what would you think would you be mapping as mesic or frigid on your particular area and where are you seeing the weed problems and where are you not seeing the weed problems? Great. Okay. Um, well, that was the last question that was written to me. So uh, thank you everyone for joining us. Thank you very much, Rick, for your presentation. Um, if you have any further questions or comments, feel free to email me, Janie, or um, you can also email at my webinar alias, which is Paula Nasiatka. <laughs> um, yeah, and thank you everyone for joining. Thanks again, Rick. Okay, um, can we, are you, when we sign off, I won't be able to visit with you anymore, or can I give you a quick call? 
Um, yeah, give me a quick call. <laughs> okay. okay, thanks. All right. All right. Bye, everyone.